People need the opportunity to be good at something. It, so then you might ask yourself, well, what's the best antidote to the discomfort of life? And you might say, well, it's comfort. And I suppose that's what you act out when you swaddle a baby. But a better antidote is something like adventure to excellence. And that's far better antidote to suffering than the mere absence of suffering. So not to say that the mere absence of suffering, that's not nothing, you know. Stepping out of that sedation from comforts, mm -hmm. difficult though, especially if you've become routinized to it. Yeah, well, that's the difficult difficulty of maturity. You know, the Freudians said very wisely that the good mother necessarily fails. What's well, that mean? It means she stops providing the comfort that insulates people against the need for adventure. I heard you say recently that um, a mother's ability to let her child go out into the world, knowing that they're still vulnerable and that it's now that's down to them and the, the world to look after them, that's one of the bravest things that they it's can the do. It's the female crucifixion. That's so, and, and that's exemplified best in, well, the best portrayal of that I've seen is Michelangelo's Pieta. You know, it's, it's a statue of Mary, uh, and she has Christ's body on her, as an adult, on her lap, and yep. he's broken and destroyed, and, you know, she's displaying that. And that's, that's the bravery of a mother, to allow that to happen, but not only that, to, to facilitate it. Facilitate it. So what about... Where you go, kid? Where you go? Where you go? Well, why? It's dangerous out there. It's like, yeah, no kidding. more dangerous here if you stay with me by a lot so you might lose your body out there in the world but if you stay here you lose your soul don't have one plan right if you're gonna stake yourself on something you should throw a couple of alternative scaffolds up beside you so that you have somewhere to go you want to be a doctor okay well you could be a nurse it's like it's not a doctor, but it beats cutting your throat. You're still doing 80% of what you wanted to do. So you want to, and you want to think about this during your whole life, man. If you're going to take a high risk, you want to scaffold yourself in other areas so that if it fails, you don't, the bottom doesn't drop out and you die. And it's also very much worth thinking about with regards to setting up your life in general. It's like, if you concentrate solely on your career, you can get a long way in your career. And I would say that that's a strategy that a minority of men preferentially do. That, that's all they do. They work like 70, 80 hours a week. They go flat out on their career. They're staking everything on the small probability of exceptional status in a narrow domain. But it's, it's hard on them. They don't have a life. It's very difficult for them to have a family. They don't know how to take any leisure activity, like they get very one-dimensional. Now, it may be that that unidimensionality is the price you have to pay to be exceptional at one thing, right? Because if you're gonna be something like a genius level mathematician, and you wanna do that for, or a scientist say, it's like, you're in your lab, you're in your lab all the time, you're working 70 hours a week or 80 hours a week, you're smart, you're dedicated, you're unidimensional, and that's how you get to beat all the other people who are doing that. It's the only way. But the problem is you don't get a life. Now, if you love being a scientist and you have that kind of focus of mind, well, first of all, you're a rare person, and second, you're gonna pay for it. But fine, more power to you. But, but it's a, it's a risky business to do that. You sacrifice a lot for it. You know, and I would say most often, if you're speaking about having a healthy life, that isn't what you do. You spread yourself out more. So, you know, you have a family, you have some things that you do outside of work that are meaningful to you and useful. You, you have a network of friends. Um, well, that, that, those three things alone are, four things alone are plenty to keep you well oriented. And then if one of those things collapses, you know, everything doesn't go. Now, the, the price you pay for that is the more you strive to optimize that balance, the less likely you are to be fantastically successful at any single one of them. But you might have a very, you know, if you con consider your life as a whole, that might be a winning strategy. One of the things Carl Jung said, I really liked this. He thought that men 
went after perfection and when women went after wholeness. So they're different, they're different value. They're, di they're different, there's something different at the top of the value hierarchy. So perfection would be stake it all on one thing and, and look for radical success. Not, all, not that all men do that, because they don't, but we're, we're talking about extremes, at, at least with the, regards to the men that do that. The wholeness idea is more like, well, I want, I want, it's like I want one thing in my life to be 150%, or I want five things in my life to be 80%. Well, there, there's a lot more richness in a life where you have five things operating at 80%, but you're not operating in any of, at any of them at 150%. So, and I really believe this because I've watched men and women go through their careers now for a long period of time, and one of the things that there's lots of things that produce this. But one of the things that I've noticed is that mostly women in their 30s bear, bail out of unidimensional careers. They won't do them. They won't, they won't put in the 80 hours a week that they would have to put in in order to dominate that particular area. And it isn't, the reason that they won't do it is because they decide it's not worth it. And no wonder, because why would that be worth it? You, you have to ask yourself that. It's like, well, you want to be an outstanding scientist. It's like, okay, really? Really, that's what you want, because that means that's what you do. Because you're competing with other people, you know, they're smart, they're hardworking, and if you want to be at the top, you have to be smarter and work harder than any of them. And working hard means working long hours. I mean, it also means working diligently, but in, in the final analysis, it's all, also an additive issue. If I'm smart and hardworking and I can crank out for 70 hours a week, and you do it for 30, it's like, in two years, I'm so far ahead of you, you will never, ever catch up. A woman is extremely bonded with her infant, say between zero and nine months, and the infant is utterly helpless. And so, complete compassion and the provision of comfort is the only job that matters, and that's really the case. And then the woman has to switch gears to some degree, the mother has to switch gears as the child starts to become more uh, more mobile fundamentally and more independent she has to let go of the infant which is a real grieving process and she has to start to facilitate this movement towards independence but that's a hard shift and so partly the role of the father in that is to be an advocate for the child's independence and to comfort the mother to let her know that that degree of security provision is no longer necessary but also to act as an advocate for the child's outgoing uh, outgoing desire and so so it's the eatable situation is not only the mother it's also say the weak father but then it's also the child so you can imagine because Jung believed that these negotiated agreements were were relational so you know you're six you're in grade one maybe you're feeling a little ill maybe you're not maybe you're playing with being a little ill and maybe you're playing with exaggerating how ill you are and your mom comes downstairs and says you know you've got a test today at school maybe you haven't quite prepared for it maybe you know you should have and she says but you know you you seem to have a tummy ache uh, maybe you're too sick to go to school and the kid thinks well, maybe i could just stay home and you know mom could tuck me in and I wouldn't have to take that test and I wouldn't have to confront the world and he says yeah I'm a, yeah mom my stomach really hurts and and away we go and the child has made a choice and you think well that's and that's a catastrophic choice and you think well children shouldn't be held accountable for choices they make at that age it's like a child's soon going to be an adult that's going to make very similar decisions the the choice has consequences and to be held accountable for that is to recognize purely that the choice has consequences and that it is a choice now you know you could say well 95 percent of the blame is to be put on the mother and maybe that's an overestimate i think it probably is but the child could say mom you don't have to worry about me i'm gonna get up and go do this and that's choice and that's the right choice so these are always chicken and egg problems, obviously, but that that fleshes out the complexity of the situation. You know, if you're if you're being enticed down a pathological road, 
you can accept or reject the invitation. Now, some people are better at enticing and some people enforce it more harshly. And, you know, there's all sorts of individual variability in situations like this. But just because you're offered the bait doesn't necessarily mean that you have to take it. So, and I'm not a determinist. I do believe that people have free will, whatever that means. That's a murky subject and it gets complicated the more you look at it, but whatever. It's still a good shorthand way of describing the fact that we seem to be cursed with responsibility for our own destiny, at least to some degree.